Hello everyone. Welcome to the last recitation. So today we are going to talk about uh, reinforcement learning, which we have not uh, covered in the lectures. So this is going to be a review for you if you have taken 10601, at least for the first part. Um, but if you're not, um, this is uh, just a gentle introduction to reinforcement learning. So let's get started. So reinforcement learning is uh, a learning paradigm in machine learning. So we have seen supervised learning, unsupervised learning in this course so far. And reinforcement learning is just another kind of uh, learning paradigm. So um, re to so put in one sentence, um, reinforcement learning is basically um, learning to make decisions. So in reinforcement learning, we have an agent and an environment, and the agent uh, observes the states and takes can take actions, and it can uh, the environment can um, give the agent reward and also update the state S. So the agent learns to make decisions based on its interaction and observation uh, within the environment. So um, you may have heard about a lot of uh, applications of reinforcement learning. Um, it uh, has applications in autonomous areas. And um, so AlphaGo learns to be the best human master on the gate of Go. And uh, it can also teach a machine agent to play Atari games like Breakout. And also um, reinforcement learning is used in robotics where we um, where we control the movement of the robots. So, yeah, so let's see how reinforcement learning um, models this decision process, which is the Markov decision process. So in the Markov decision process, we basically have a um, finite state space, a finite action space, and the the state transition model, which uh, models the uh, probability of um, going to the next state, given the current state, and an action. And also a reward model, which gives the value of a reward. Um, if an agent takes um, an action, it goes from the current state S to the next state. S prime. Okay, so let's talk about value function, Q function, and Bellman equation. So what is a value function? Uh, so intuitively, it determines how valuable a given state is for the agent. So the value function depends on the policy using which the agent perform actions. So um, the value at a particular state using a policy pi is given by this equation, uh, which is simply um, the, expect the expected total reward uh, starting from uh, the current state. Note, note that um, at each future time step, the reward is discounted by a factor of gamma, so the reward has uh, exponentially less weight as a function of time. This way, uh, we prevent the total reward from going to infinity. And also, the agent will prefer actions that has um, immediate reward uh, rather than rewards uh, in the future. And among all value functions, there exists an optimal value function whose value is greater than the other uh, functions for all states. 
and the optimal policy pi star is uh, just um, corresponds to the optimal value. So looking at the equation here, so we can see that the optimal uh, value function v star is simply uh, the maximum um, value function across all of the possible uh, policies pi. And the optimal policy pi star uh, is simply the policy that maximizes the value function. So what is the Q value function? So Q value is a function of a state action pair. Um, so it determines how valuable taking an action A is from a given state S. And um, so V star of S, which is the optimal value function, can be obtained by finding the maximum over all of the possible uh, optimum Q values from, um, from this given state S. And uh, the um, Q star SA is equal to the summation of the immediate reward after performing action A while in state S and the discounted expected future reward after the transition to a next state S prime. So um, what this means is that if we know the optimal Q function, we can extract the optimal policy by simply choosing the action that maximizes Q for a state S. So remember, remember that the goal of an agent in a Markov decision process is to find the optimal policy. So a policy is basically a mapping from states to actions. So if we know the optimal Q function, Q star for each state, then um, the policy can just map the states to the action that gives the maximum Q star. So hopefully this is intuitive. And uh, here is the Bellman equation. So this is basically what we have said in the last slide, um, put into math. So um, the optimal Q value function Q star SA here is equal to the sum of the um, immediate reward um, R of S and A plus the discounted future um, expected um, re reward, uh, which is the ex ex uh, which is the expectation of the um, value, uh, the optimal value function of the next states S prime. And if we expand this, we can see that it is simply the summation over all of the possible next states of the probability of transitioning to that state times the optimal value function of that state. And uh, since by definition, the optimal value function uh, is simply the maximum over all of the possible actions of the, Q, of the, of the optimal Q values, we can uh, rewrite this using uh, the equation for Q values above um, so that we have a, uh, an equation um, written just in the, um, the values B. Um, so notice that the Bellman equation can be written by only using V star or Q star. This means that we can extract the optimal policy by having a good estimate of either of those two functions. Now, so one of such algorithm is called value iteration. It is basically, um, we compute the optimal uh, state value by um, improving the value, um, the estimation of uh, V of S iteratively from a random start value. So we repeatedly update the Q values and the, and the value V 
until it converges, and uh, it is guaranteed to converge to the to the optimal values. So looking at the pseudocode here, it's pretty much um, self-explanatory. So we first initialize the uh, value function v of s to for all states to arbitrary values, and uh, we iterate through all of the states and all of the actions, and we um, calculate the q values um, based on the current um, uh, value functions. So um, using the Bellman equation, and then we update the value function um, using the maximum q value until um, the value function converge. Now, in value iteration, um, since the agent is optimizing for the optimal policy, it might converge before the value function. Um, so, we, uh, since the agent only cares about the policy, the optimum, the optimal policy, so why don't we just optimize the policy, right? So, in policy iteration, um, instead of repeatedly improving the value function, um, we can just redefine the policy at each time step, at each iteration, and uh, we compute the value uh, using uh, the policy and repeat until convergence. So looking at the pseudocode here, at each iteration, we compute the values using the policy pi by solving the linear equations, which are just um, Bellman equations using the current policy. And then we improve the policy at each state using the value that we just calculated. So um, we uh, just update the action um, for each state to the one that gives the, the best value. And we repeat until this policy converges. And uh, one thing to note is that uh, it looks like the policy iteration takes more time per iteration um, to compute. But in practice, it is usually uh, takes much less iterations than value iteration, So, which makes this algorithm uh, overall more uh, computationally uh, efficient than the value iteration. All right, so let's. Um, so policy and value iteration can be used when the agent has prior knowledge about the world. So, which is all the states of the actions and the possible states transitions and the possible reward. So this is called offline planning. And uh, now let's look at a more uh, realistic problem setting which, where um, the agent only knows about the set of possible states and actions and can ob observe the uh, environment current state. So in this setting, the agent must actively learn through its interactions with the environment. And um, so Q-learning is a model free learning algorithm that uh, doesn't assume anything about the uh, uh, state transition or rewards. So it, this means that it does not try to explicitly learn models of the environment state transitions and reward function. And uh, yeah, it learns the policy entirely from its interaction with the environment. And Q-learning tries to basic approximate the Q value of the state action pairs from the samples of the um, Q value that were observed during the inter interaction um, as opposed to value iteration we, where we are just uh, estimating the values. So notice that we are still just using the Bellman equation, but this time we just write it uh, using the Q values. So, so one problem 
for uh, deep for Q learning is that uh, the space of the states can be can be huge. So, for example, if you want to train an agent to pay to play Atari, Atari games, the state space is effectively the uh, all of the possible com combination of the pixel values uh, on the screen, which is going to be exponential. So it's not practical to have like a giant table of uh, mapping from the state action pairs to the Q values. So we need some way of um, approximating this as a function. So this is where um, deep Q learning, deep learning becomes useful because we can simply train a new model to uh, approximate the Q values for all the actions given the state as the input. So this is the basic idea of Q learning. And Bhuvan is going to tell you more about the detail. Welcome to recitation 14, part two uh, of reinforcement learning. In the first part of the recitation, we saw the introduction and basics of reinforcement learning. And this included, this included Markov decision processes and um, dynamic programming, including state value functions and um, Q learning. So in this part of the recitation, we will look at deep reinforcement learning and how it can be used to solve some uh, really interesting real world problems. Uh, so this video is on an RM agent, a reinforcement learning agent that is trying to play uh, the breakout game in Atari. Uh, so this is after 100 episodes and you can see that the agent has learned some of the things but still isn't performing that well. Uh, this is after a few more, after 100 more training episodes. So in, uh, this makes a total of 200 training episodes. And now at 400 training episodes, there is a visible improvement in the agent. It can actually uh, move where the ball is going and hit the ball. But the most interesting uh, bit of this video is this, 600 training episodes, where the agent kind of finds an optimal policy of uh, digging the tunnel at one side of the ball, uh, one side of the game. So here it's digging it on the left side and then kind of uh, pushing the ball on one side of the uh, bricks so that it keeps bouncing between the top wall and the bricks. So um, how do we actually learn such an agent? But first of all, uh, let's define our learning task here. What do we actually want? So our input is uh, the game representation. In this case, uh, we are just given the raw pixels of the frames of the game. And we want to kind of map those pixels to the action that we want to take at that particular time step or a probability distribution over the action that we want to take at that particular time step. So in this case, as we can see, uh, on the left side, we have uh, this uh, input frame. And on the right side, we have these all possible actions. And these actions range from just from the joystick to depressing the button or a combination of both. So um, just a quick recap of Q-learning that we just saw. So in Q-learning, we have this estimate of the Q value of each state and action pair. And at each time step, we update that estimate using this equation. So we take the current estimate and we uh, add this error multiplied with the learning rate alpha. And this error is very interesting because it uh, consists of two main parts. On the left hand side, we have the sum of the reward and the maximum Q value at the next state. And this is known as the Q learning target. And from that, we subtract our current estimate of the Q function. And this gives us a Q learning error. So um, can we just use Q learning to uh, train such an agent? So in principle, yes, because as we can see, 
the number of states is finite. So each pixel can take a finite number of values and the number of actions are also finite. So in theory, you could build a very large table of each state and action and learn the Q values for each possible state and action pair. But it turns out that's not very feasible. Well, firstly, because our data is very high dimensional. So in Atari, um, the input pixels uh, have dimension, the input frames have dimensions of 210 by 160 pixels, and it is a color video running at 60 frames a second. So if you do the math, it turns out to be approximately 10 to the 7,000 number of states. And the main problem that you will notice is that it is too large to store in any kind of memory. But suppose that you had that kind of memory and you somehow have built a huge table. So you now have an entry for each state and action pair. But still, even if you do that, it would be too slow to learn the Q value for each state and action pair. Because you would have to go over all these possible states and all these possible action pairs and update them enough number of times so that you have a good estimate of the Q function with that uh, state action pair. And finally, it's not able to generalize. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so I'll just go back to this game of Pong here. I'm sorry, breakout. Uh, so notice that the, the ball here is in this position. Now suppose I shift this ball by one pixel to the right. Does that really change the state of the game that much? No, right? Because it's just one pixel and whatever value the state has at this particular state, uh, at this particular position, you would expect the state value to be very similar if you just change this by one pixel. But in Q learning, we have a different Q value for each state and action pair. And even if the state is changed by one pixel, you could have a completely different Q value. So you want a learning paradigm so that it is able to generalize to uh, different states and it's maybe even unseen states. So what do we do here? The main idea behind this uh, on how to scale up reinforcement learning it's called function approximation. So you estimate the value function using function approximations or some function uh, of the state or the action. So for instance, if you're approximating the uh, state value function, which is denoted by v pi, then you could have a function which has a single input state and which is parameterized by some parameters w. Similarly, if you want to approximate your state action value function, q pi, you could have a function which um, has inputs state and action, and which is also parameterized by some weights, w. And this kind of has two main advantages. Firstly, it's able to generalize, uh, because if your states are close to each other, you could expect, if it's a continuous function, you could expect the values also of this function to be kind of close to each other. And secondly, the memory requirements are now drastically reduced. So if you have a lookup table, then you need a table of size which is equal to the number of states or the number of state action pairs that are possible. But in this case, uh, the size that you would require is just the number of parameters or the size uh, of the function that you are using. So for instance, if you were using a neural network, then that would be basically the total number of neurons in your neural network and so on. So um, what does function approximation actually look like? So you take in, so let's say you are approximating uh, v pi of s. So you take in as input uh, the state s, some representation of s, and you have these weights of your function. So you can uh, modify these weights, and you want to modify these weights 
such that the output closely matches the true value function um, of this particular uh, policy. Similarly, if you are approximating the state action value function, you could uh, have two inputs, S and A, and, which out, and this function would output uh, the Q for that particular pair. And this is another possible uh, approach you could have, which also approximates the Q function. So the input here is just a single S, but you now have multiple outputs and one output for each possible action uh, that you have, that you can possibly take. So before I go forward, I would like to talk about state representation. So for a particular state, you now have a representation of that particular state, which is just a vector of some values. So in the first example that we saw of uh, the Atari video games, the state representation is simply the input pixels in the video games. Uh, if you are trying to play chess, for example, then the state could be just the position of the different pieces on that board. But it doesn't really have to be that. You can have, you, you can obviously have handcrafted features in your state representation. So for example, in chess, it might be a good idea to also include, uh, let's say the number of pawns on each side, because that might be helpful in trying to det determine which side is winning and the value of a particular state. So um, now our learning problem has kind of reduced to estimating the parameters of this um, a neural network such that the output of the neural network closely matches the true state action value of the particular state action value pair. So we can borrow some ideas from supervised learning. So as we have already seen in this course, in supervised learning, we want to map an input X to a corresponding output Y. And this is kind of similar to what we are doing here, except that you want, here we want to map the particular state and action pair to uh, the actual Q value for that particular state and action. But notice that we don't actually have this value because this is what we are trying to estimate in the first place. And this is kind of the main problem of reinforcement learning. So what can we do here? Uh, one simple solution is to use the Q learning target. And uh, as we saw in one of the previous slides, the Q learning target is simply the sum of the reward at the current time step plus the maximum Q value using our current using our estimate of the Q value for the next state. And now uh, we look at Q learning with function approximation. So you want to minimize the mean squared error between the Q learning targets and the actual function that you're getting. So this is very similar to supervised learning, except the fact that instead of these, these targets, you have actually the ground truth labels of your particular problem. But it turns out that just naively trying to minimize the mean squared error between these targets and the current output is a bit unstable and um, it doesn't uh, converge well in practice. It's kind of difficult to optimize. So uh, what can we do here? So let's look at why this actually happened in the first place. So this is the key learning update with function approximation. So at iteration i, the loss function with respect to the parameters theta is simply the mean squared error between the key learning target and the current output of the neural network. But uh, if you notice closely, you can see that the targets change with each iteration. And this is very different from the supervised setting that we have seen in this course so far, because the targets for a particular label are fixed with respect to time and across iterations. But in this case, 
we are computing the targets using the neural network that we are training and the targets depend on the parameters theta i secondly consecutive updates are highly correlated so if you recall from uh, the gradient descent lectures when you use stochastic gradient descent um, uh, or in supervised learning in general you assume that your data is uncorrelated and your samples are independent so how do we solve these problems uh, right so these two are the main problems which make the training unstable and difficult so just to sum up our challenges are now to somehow make the updates less correlated and to somehow make the targets more stable so how do you overcome this problem of correlated samples well you can do this by a technique called experience replay so this is you just have some buffer which is also known as a replay memory and you store each transition in that buffer so instead of taking the step and instead of updating the parameters you simply store that step in some memory for future use and when you update you randomly select some samples so you randomly select a mini batch from that sample and then you minimize the loss function using those samples now what are the advantages of using replay memory or experience replay well firstly your samples are now non consecutive and this resembles iid data but there's another advantage of this is the fact that each sample can now be used multiple times so it is essentially making this algorithm more sample efficient because earlier you were just looking at one stream performing one update and then kind of throwing that experience away but in now you can store that uh you can store that experience in your experience replay buffer and you can do multiple updates on that particular memory so now um, how do we overcome the second problem and recall our second problem was the fact that our targets were changing with each iteration so how do we overcome this problem of moving targets well the solution is pretty simple you now maintain two networks and to compute the targets you now compute the targets using a separate target network and you periodically update the parameters of the target network using your main network from which you're calculating the q values so again what are the advantages of using a separate target network well firstly it helps in stabilizing the learning uh, learning process as instead of chasing Uh, moving targets you now have some kind of stability in your problem and secondly as we see later in the results it works uh, pretty well empirically so our new loss function is now slightly different so notice that now we have an expectation and this expectation essentially means that uh, you randomly sample a mini batch from experience replay and you, then you take a mean of uh the squared error also in the target when we calculate in the q network we are now using a different set of parameters so this is theta sub i super superscript dash which is different from your actual q q network which is simply theta sub i and uh these parameters do not change with every iteration but after a particular after like let's say 100 iterations you could copy these parameters into this network and uh, these are the results of uh, that particular paper so the video that we saw in the beginning they actually tested their model out on all the atari games and this line represents uh, which whether the human uh, plays better or whether the reinforcement learning plays uh, agent plays better and this was way back in 2015 now this line is probably somewhere here uh, but yeah you can see that in many of the games uh, 
the agent outperforms the human by a big margin. So now let's uh, look at some ablation studies. So the first is the importance of experience replay and the separate target key network. So in this, the first column uh, includes both, both of these tricks. The second column includes just the replay buffer but no target queue network. The third column in, includes just the target queue network but no experience replay. And finally, the fourth is simply the vanilla uh, deep queue learning without any of these. And you can see that even if you remove any one of these components, the performance drastically drops uh, across all the games. Similarly, um, it also had this table highlights the importance of the particular function approximator that we're using. So in this case, we are using a deep convolutional network. So given the input uh, pixels of the game, we first have a few convolutions and then we have many hidden layers and nonlinearities until we get a probability distribution or not, I'm sorry, not a probability distribution until we get the Q values. And we can see that from there's a big improvement if you use a deep convolution network as compared to a simple uh, linear baseline. And if you want to read more about this, you can uh, refer to this paper. Uh, yep, that's it for the recitation. Thank you.